Resource for Writers podcast, where each week you get mini craft talks from creative writing teachers and working writers. Head over to resourceforwriters.com where you can join writing groups, classes, book clubs, and many other events. We hope you like this episode. Welcome to the Resource for Writers podcast. I'm Roxanne McDonald. And who are you? And I'm Desi Link. And uh, this is our first test run. So it's Wednesday after I've just run two feedback groups. And the idea was that I was going to just, we were just going to meet. And then I'm going to kind of point out some stuff that I dealt with this week or worked with writers on and then um, talk about, talk about whatever comes up. So Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. Um, I think the thing that came up so clearly this week with the writers that I was working with, especially a coaching client was the coaching client came in um, and she a lot of times when I sit down with a coaching client, I say like, what are, what are you wanting to work on? Or what are the questions you have? Or are there things you have concern about with this piece of writing? And, um, cause it usually, it keys me into like, not just only following their lead, but to kind of go, I feel like what I'm doing as a coach is trying to hone people's ability to both listen to their gut because most of us have come to writing from reading and we have a really high taste level, but then we have this diminished ability to like, look critically, look constructively at our own work, right? We have a critical mind that goes, it sucks, but we don't have that constructive um, ability to look constructively, but we have that feeling in our gut where we're reading it. And every time we're like, Oh, there's just something at this one part, or I'm feeling like it's not quite doing this thing. So this writer today came in and said, um, I feel like I need to, uh, I need to describe these, ge- these characters gestures more because of, I, I wanted to, to convey more emotion and, I, my take on it was that she, or she knew that it wasn't holding the emotion that she wanted it to. She wasn't having the contain, she wasn't having this emotion be present, but the issue wasn't that the humans and characters in this story weren't expressing emotion. It was that she, or she thought that what she needed was the characters to express the emotion, but almost inevitably what will express emotion better is writing about place and things. Mm -hmm. And it's this, it's, it's this idea that we, um, when we're writing, we think, oh, these characters are the ones with the emotions, but most of the time it's this entire scene or world vibrating with emotion. And we are seeing how the the characters interact with that. And Mm -hmm. then we get keyed into how they're actually feeling because it's that idea of like show don't tell right and that has been said way too much but it is because the vast majority of people come into writing um with doing narrative exposition where they just explain things instead of slowing down and putting people into scene and describing things right but um the showing part of this is actually allowing, um, allowing there to be sim like everything is a symbol. Everything is vibrating. Everything is emoting. And that what, how you get to that is you just write so much detail that you are bored out of your mind as the writer. And generally once you've gotten to the point where you are like, I cannot write about this one fucking coffee cup anymore or how, you know, the kitchen or the paint on the walls. And generally when a writer gets to that point is when they are actually starting to write an emotional uh, uh, container for the, the, the characters to engage in. Mm-hmm. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it does. It kind of um, the descri- description kind of sets the tone for the overall scene. It puts the writers or the readers right into it. Mm-hmm. And I think for first person point of view too, their description of their environment is very telling. Yes, we well, and you reveal so much by how somebody sees something, mm-hmm. right? We want to say, I you know, he hate or I hate uh, I hate fast food restaurants. 
and that's flat. But if you have somebody walk into a fast food restaurant and just see the like grimy yellow tables and everything is plastic and they hate all the, all the waste and they watch people, they, they hyper notice that people are trying to like put their trays into that little hole of a garbage can and then it won't go. And then there's so much garbage, you know, that will convey why they hate it, how they hate it, what flavor of hate they have for it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, way more effective, way more effective. But third person does it too. When, when it's, you describe, you describe place and things and what people want oftentimes is we want, we want things to mean more than they do. We want totems, symbols, right? We want a coffee cup, not just to be a coffee cup. We want it to be the, you know, the, like, it's the thing when we get blown away as readers where we go, oh my God, that coffee cup was like so intense or Mm -hmm. that I felt so sad. Right. And it's because you have, you have written into it. And then once you put so many things in a place and you describe them, usually they will emerge. It's like the, um, the idea of details coalescing around a moment to, to have an epiphany. And what we tend to do is want to tell people this was intense and suddenly he realized and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's not how, that's not how a reader experiences an epiphany. A reader experiences an epiphany, how a person experiences an epiphany. And that is by taking in whole bunches of details and information and, and, and moving forward bit by bit. And then it coalescing around to go, Oh, Whoa, this isn't a, 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 of emotional peak. This is a crisis. This is a, you know, this yes. means more than it does. You can't quite say why, you know, why, like the, um, why you feel an emotion, but you, you're like, oh, that the, I do. I feel an emotion about that teapot screaming on the stove, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. It's a buildup of all the details and all the, the moments and the experiences that lead to that epiphany. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I would say the vast majority of students that I've ever worked with, I've worked with a couple who don't, who come in at a different learning curve, but the vast majority don't give enough detail Mm. like that, that in, and Ellen Bass, who was my mentor and has been teaching writing full-time for like over 50 something years. And her number one thing, she was like, if I could just tell, if everyone would just listen to me, they would cut like 30 years off of their time of learning how to write. And she's like, slow down and write detail. (laughs) All in the details. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The other thing she says is that, um, uh, using, if she had known that every book was a teacher, she would have gotten better much quicker, but that's a whole other episode. Yes. But about how to read like a writer. Mm-hmm. And she really taught me how to do that. But the thing about slowing down that the vast majority of people I've worked with worry that they're going to be boring if they slow down and write detail. And it's like, no, like you, we're, we're not going to be bored because we're going to be invested with the, the most of the time. The problem is, is that they're moving too fast. Right. And we have no, we have no grounding. We don't understand and that people will, when we do detail, people will want to describe, um, action. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, if we don't, if action is just, it's like the idea of like a blank, a white piece of paper with stick figures on it. And the stick figures are in a fight. Mm-hmm. That's how most of writing happens where we're like, and then he hit him. And then he did that. But we're like, there's then we need feet on the ground and we need to know what the ground is and then what era that ground is, you know, like, and then the, we need walls or we need a, a landscape and we need to know what the weather is. And then we, you know, we need all the, and then we need to know what, what, what the bodies are, these people that are having this fight. And then we need to know what the clothing is and whether they chose that clothing or not. And then we need to know, like, then you see how it can start building and building and building. And then you get less and less bored. The more you have of this picture painted. Yes. You're put into it more. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it's easier though, for people just to focus on the action and the characters and what they're doing. We love characters and we like to see them moving, but uh-huh. definitely got to slow down for sure. Slow way down, way mm-hmm. down. Like I, I had it. I, I mean, I, I had it where, um, when I really got serious about writing, um, Ellen had this thing where she would, she 
for weeks, she would just go, you write about stuff and then say then, and then let something happen and then write a few more sentences about place and things. And then you get to say then, (laughs) and I had to, I had to do these like calisthenics where I was like, I wasn't allowed to move anything forward until I wrote detail. And then, and it was like, I was pacing out and then, (laughs) and that's what I I feel like when I'm working with clients, I'll put them through calisthenics like that, because then you get to, you actually start to see that there's like, there's all these options for conveying emotion, for moving the, the story forward that are not just plot. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think plot is one of the most boring parts of a writing. Like, the experience along the way that matters, those details, right? Yeah. Plot, plot is just stuff that happened. And then that, I mean, that basically people will go and I have this great idea. And I'm like, well, that's plot. That's a whole bunch of memoirs mm-hmm. come and go, I lived through some crazy shit. And I'm like, that's plot, but yeah. plot doesn't matter unless there's other stuff going along with it. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is a thousand other episodes that we can get into about what's the core transformation, what how, what's the process of that transformation, what are we focused on, you know, what how are these, how is each character playing a part in in the protagonist transformation, right? And where is it happening, and in what what dynamic? But if you don't have details, you don't have dynamic. If you don't have the era that something's happening in, and we it's not alive for mm-hmm. us, like then we don't, we don't understand the dynamic. Something you and I sitting here talking in 1950 would be a completely different dynamic than it is you and I sitting on Zoom in 2022, True. right? It's a completely different dynamic. A whole bunch of stuff is different. It's even different if you and I were talking in January of 2019, right? It's, yep. We would know that two people sitting on Zoom in 2022 have probably been on Zoom way too much, <laughs> right? Like, and then if, if, you know, if people are listening to this, it makes a difference, right? If it be between whether they're watching us. So if they're watching us on YouTube, they're going to know what I look like. They're going to know what you look like. They're going to understand there's a dynamic here, right? If you're 80 years old and I'm 17, everyone, Desi Link is 80 years old, (laughs) has white hair. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I'm a seven foot tall um, Brazilian supermodel. Hey. That's 17. (laughs) But, you know, I see like that, those, that information all plays a really big role in everything. So then that's the thing when I'm working with people about detail is that so much emotion is going to be conveyed because of dynamic about place, time, stuff, right? How, and then the characters will then interact with that place and time and stuff in a way that matters to us. Yeah. It goes back to the experience of it all. You know, you don't want to just, you, when we read a book, that's what it is. We are experiencing it and you need to be grounded within it in order to enjoy it. You know, when you read a piece of writing, you're, you're just like, wow. Like I'm in it. Like sometimes I got to go back. Like I need to reread that. And it is the details that Mm -hmm. makes me feel that way. Yeah. And the, and most of the time it's not, we don't, we don't lose, of course there are some books and people will come to me inevitably when somebody starts to argue with me about slowing down, they'll say, I don't want to be like one of those writers that's writing like 10 pages about the Moors in England. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you're, it's, you're going to, you would have to work so hard to do that. Like, it's not going to happen. Right. But, um, Steve Almond, who's a great teacher says, um, you, you have to give the reader the information necessary for them to have the emotional experience that you intend. And most of the time we're not, we're just telling people, um, I want you to feel, I want, you know, this character feels bad, but you don't make the reader feel bad. You're wanting, we're wanting to manipulate their emotions as writers. And the way that we do that is we give them them the information they need in order to have that emotional experience, which 
is not explaining emotions to them. It's making, you know, characters engage realistically in a world that matters to us. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the, the rules that like when I am teaching people to do this is that I will say, make us care if this place burned down right enough to where we would care if that place burned down. And most of the time on first drafts, like I don't, I don't make people care if a place burns down, but if I go into it and I'm like, okay, I need to describe this enough to where people would like, be like, oh, it's hmm, sad that place burned at least. Mm-hmm. Like I know that place. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like, yeah. If you know the place you're going to, it's going to matter that if it, if it disappeared. Right. And I think even with like, um, I mean, there's a story called, um, the, the book maze runner, I think, mm-hmm. yeah. Maze runner. Yeah. Did you read that? I haven't. Well, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's not, I don't write in that genre, but, and I could talk about this book forever because yeah. it's, it's not a literary book, but the guy, the writer, like it starts off and there's like, I think a kid who's like naked in an elevator. That's just metal. And all we, all we are is there. And then he uh, like comes up and then we discover with him what the world is like. Right. And we, you know, he, he's describing for a, several pages, a metal elevator with nothing in it. Oh, wow. I don't think he's naked. Actually. I think he's got some sort of like uniform on or something, but it's very stark. And then he comes up and then we are put into this ecosystem of other kids in this like encampment thing. And then said, you know, and then he builds out the world, but it's, and it's not a fun world, but it would be, it matters because you're like, you understand the place, right? You, and the writer was able to get you, um, like hooked onto Mm -hmm. this character's story just from being in the elevator. Right. Yeah. And from describing it, not like, this boy is scared in the elevator because Mm -hmm. he doesn't know, he doesn't know, he doesn't know. I mean, that's really what the entire beginning of this book would be about. He doesn't know he's confused. How do I do it? How do I internal dialogue? That's the thing. I'm like, don't do internal dialogue unless you really know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Internal dialogue is not your friend. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to take a note on that internal dialogue. (laughs) Not your everyone, friend. yeah, their internal dialogue is not your friend until you are so sure that you have written time and place and era and stuff like stuff. Yes, there's so many other ways to convey mm-hmm. the emotions and thoughts and all that. You don't need to do the internal dialogue, right? No, and the internal dialogue is not going to be as effective. Of course, people, I bet you if we put this episode out, there are going to be people going, well, what about this passage of internal dialogue or this entire book that's all internal dialogue? And I'm like, great, if somebody successfully, you know, did that. But um, I think most of the time, it's not very effective. It's not very effective when it's not a choice. If it's just, this is how somebody this is like this is the only way I know how to write this and it's like no if it's a choice if you're like okay I know that I you know I know exact I've I've written I know exactly where they are I know how they're engaging with this place I know all the stuff in this place and then I'm choosing to do internal dialogue Mm -hmm. then that could be effective Mm -hmm. it's like I mean I know I'm coming out swinging but uh so I was a swing dancer for many years and I would teach swing dancing. And I mean, I had been swing, I had been swing dancing like constantly and very, and taken, you know, I was a good swing dancer and I did it for decades, right? People would come in to the class and I would be teaching them. Like, these are the basic steps. This is how you hold hands with another person and talk to them. And they would be like, no, no, no. I want to do all this like woo woo stuff. And I'd be like, well, that's not, 
that's, you know, that, and they'd be like, no, or I'd be like, okay, you need to stop that because this is in, interfering with your communication with your partner. And they go, well, that's my style. And I'd mm-hmm. go, okay, if it's your style, then you are capable of stopping that and doing the basics and then putting it back in. Mm-hmm. And then they would be like, well, no, I can't. Cause that's my style. I'm like, it's not style. If it's not a choice, mm-hmm. if you don't know your, if you don't know the like foundation of whatever it is you're doing, it's not style. Yeah. And that's it's not the, intentional. No. And if you don't, if it's not a choice, like, you know, like you're just doing it just because you don't know how to not do it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's not intentional. It's not, I mean, there was like, I hurt my ankle really bad and I had to relearn how to dance. And I learned how to dance without bouncing at all. And mm-hmm. then I became this like super smooth, like swing dancer. Right. It was a choice because I had to do it, but I knew the foundation and I could make myself bounce like everybody else. But I was like, well, if I do that too much, I'm going to blow my ankle out again. And then I had a style of like, oh, it looks like she's floating on glass on ice. And I'd be like, yeah, that's my style. But it was because I put in years of work mm-hmm. to make it a choice. Lay that I foundation. Mm-hmm. The, yeah, this foundation. And so that would be the thing too, is that like, if people are learning to write. I think when we start talking about the craft of writing, it shuts people down. People are like, it's all rules, right? You're going to say I'm bad. And it's like, well, no, like it's like, you're, it's all getting way more opportunities. It's mm-hmm. all getting way more tools in, in your belt, way more things that you're able to do. Um, and like, I'm going to quote Alan Bass again, because she's, you know, I love her she's a, you know, she's a poet and she teaches poetry and poets get real, like they get real precious about like beginning poets, right? They're like, this is my heart. It's my internal expression. Right. Mm -hmm. And people will get real precious of going, well, if I learn too much about writing, I'm going to lose my, my voice. And I've hear, I hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lose my, I don't want to, I, I have an original voice. I don't want to lose it. Right she told, she pointed this thing out and it is so true being a full-time creative writing teacher. When you're looking at lots of writing, the, the people with the least amount of work developing craft and the least amount of experience all sound more alike to each Mm -hmm. other than the ones who have done the work to be, to develop the craft of writing. And you don't know that as a beginning writer or as somebody who hasn't jumped in to learn the craft of writing, because you're not hearing a whole bunch of other writers. So you don't know that you're sounding just like all these other people. What you have is your tender beating heart and this dream of having, you know, your story out there or your poem out there, which is beautiful. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of my work is to keep that desire and that heart and passion intact while developing the craft of writing so that you don't sound like the 80% of people who are turning in their work and go and, and as, you know, as, as somebody who reads a lot of work in progress, I will completely stand behind what Ellen says. They, mm-hmm. they sound so similar. And the ones who've done work sound that you can tell the difference between writer to writer. Mm-hmm. I feel like the more you develop your craft and work on it, the more you grow into the writer that you're supposed to be, yes. you know, and you don't lose that voice. You actually sharpen it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that there's the, like, when I'm as a teacher, what I'm trying to do a lot is to, is to, I, I'm, I said, uh, somebody, I was in her, I was in this podcast and I was like, well, kind of what I do is I like put my, I'm like a little bloodhound. I put my nose down and I'm like, what are you trying to do here? So I'm being this like intense, but generous reader is what I feel like I have developed is to go a a, a non, like the average reader is going to go. I don't know what you try. I don't know what you did. But a, a, a generous reader is going to be looking for where are they going? What are they trying to do? And then as a teacher, I'm like all these options to go, okay, yes. if, were you trying to have it be tense here? I, I see that you were going towards tense. Let's raise the intensity. Let's, let's, mm-hmm. let's raise the stakes. Is this, were you, were, was this supposed to be, you know, like a love scene? Let's move into that. Is this, and so, and so I think 
having people be moving more into like the re like making what they really want happen, happen on the page. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, writing is a difficult thing because it's this, it's not only that we have a vision, all artists have some vision, right? But what we have is that it's words and words are our thoughts and ideas. And we go, when we're putting it out, we think this isn't, we, we forget that it's a product we're making. A painter doesn't forget that it's a product that they're making so that they can go, oh, I could go, I could do lighter paint right here. Mm -hmm. I could do darker paint over here. Maybe I'll paint over it and start again, because this thing that I'm making isn't what I was thinking of, right? Mm -hmm. A writer this is why we all get stuck at times is because we go, my ideas and thoughts are not good enough mm -hmm. because we're working specifically in this thing that is hard to differentiate between yeah. what goes on inside. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to take this fight, like vibrantly colorful world that we have in our brain and turn it into little tiny black and white symbols that will then infect another person. Mm -hmm. So there's this, all these steps with writing that is so difficult to deal with our ego about. Right. So personal. It's hard to separate so, it, yeah. to step back and, and look at it. Like you said, an artist would, you know, someone yeah. giving a painting. Well, and it's like, that's the reason why in, in the writers groups that I run is that we always say the, you know, the writer, the mother, the thing to do, to be very clear that we are like both holding on to everyone came here because of a deep passion for their stories and for the literary world and for, you know, and something, a dream that they have, even if their dream is to just write it down. But when we, when we start to go, I'm making something, it's a product. It is not just my thoughts and ideas and dreams. It's a thing that then I can make choices about and I can craft. And then, and then you stop getting so precious about it. And you start getting really like, I get so excited now because I'm like, we can make anything okay. like there is no holds barred. Once you get past that threshold of my ego goes, maybe my thoughts and ideas are not good enough. Mm -hmm doesn't that make writers want to improve too? Like when they think it's not good enough, doesn't that encourage them to want to revise and hear that advice? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think people, there's a great, um, uh, little tiny, like talk from Ira Glass, who does this American life. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, there's this, um, the difference, like, so we all, he, specifically writing. So we come into writing because we have a love for stories and books and poetry and da da da, right? So we've probably been consuming it for years and years and years. And it's, I'm making my hands if people are just listening, but it's way up here, right? And then we come in to go, I want to make something. And then our ability is way down here. And the thing that we, what most people have is that they already came in with really great taste. And then that distance between what you can make and your taste level makes a lot of people stop and give up. And so it does make us want to improve, but it also sometimes feels completely overwhelming because we're like, my taste level keeps rising too. Cause if you're wanting to be a good writer, you got to read a lot. And the more, the better writer you want to be, the more you have to read. And so then as you read your taste level is going to continue be improving. But if you go in and start working on your craft and are working and doing it like calisthenics, like you go to the gym and it's like, maybe every squat you do is not going to be on a competition stage, but writers have this idea that it's like every word we write has to be publishable. Right. So that's the reason why I'm always pressuring or pushing this idea of like, no, like go in and like do some jumping jacks, like describe a glass of water, describe a room, throw it away. Like it's like going to the gym. But what that does is it increases your craft ability. And so then as your, your ability to make something gets closer to your taste level, that's when you start to feel that like sparkly yes. thing of like, you surprise yourself and you feel good about it. Even if you feel nervous, yes. like that's yeah. what we go for. That's what we strive for. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not perfection. We're never going to get to perfection, but it's getting that. So it's, it's closer. The, though most writers, I think have a difficult time. Like I, I can't, I, this is why a podcast about writing is going to be hard because I just, you can see, I geek out my ADHD comes in and I'm like, oh. um, the, the, th this is, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh my God. I was so excited about something too, but about well, that's what we strive for that near, you know, like our idols, you know, we want to get in our own way, in our own style. And when mm -hmm. that happens, it's just the best feeling ever. And then we want to write the next thing. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We want to, I mean, we, I mean, when I'm teaching, I'm trying to like go both, like, I know at times I'm going to, um, I'm going to upset every writer I work with. Cause if I'm not doing that, then I'm not pushing them. I'm not giving them my mm. all. So, I mean, just today, like I have this amazing writer and I can see there's this like next level hurdle that she's going to have to learn. And I pushed and I'm like, Oh, she's not going to like me this week. Like, she's going to be like, I don't, I'm, she doesn't understand me. She does. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, I have to accept that. Right. Mm -hmm. But that when you hit that next level and it becomes, you, you become capable and you get all these more choices about what you can do. It's exhilarating and beautiful. Yeah. And like, yeah. It's kind of like having a um, personal trainer, you know, That's they keep pushing you and you think you can't do it and they keep pushing you and then you mm -hmm. reach it and you're thankful later, you know? Yes. But it's not comfortable when you're doing it mm -hmm. and you, you don't necessarily always want to go to the gym, but you do it anyways. And yeah, it's not just about products. Yeah. So, and the courses that you teach your workshops, I mean, that is some intense, you know, <laughs> it's intense training as a writer because it's weekly. They have to produce things weekly and share and mm -hmm. get feedback on it and then come back next week, you know? So I think it's a great program though, for writers that are really just ready to, to publish their work, you know? Well, yeah, but it's not even just about publishing. Cause a lot of my writers, I, I, I personally haven't published that much. I think you have published in literary magazines more than me. Like I, I have not focused on that. I got really, um, years ago I was like in the publishing and then I was like, I want to become a way better writer before I do this. Mm -hmm. And then the process of doing it actually became my focus. Like I am like, um, not, I'm not against publishing. I would, you know, I have some publishing, but whatever. Yes. Um, but a lot of my writers aren't even doing it specifically for publishing. Like I don't even really talk about publishing in the groups. It's mm -hmm. though this dedication to creativity and craft and the model. So and what we're talking about is I do these, um, I have a couple weekly feedback groups where 10 writers come together in a group and they stay together for long periods of time, like over, you know, a lot of writers have been in them for years and you, you give in just like 750 words a week. And then we all, you read it aloud and we give feedback. And it is like, it's like, a, I mean, you can hear me. I get, I get going and I'm like this and that and this and that. Right. And it's like, everybody is in it with you. And then you go back and you work on your bigger project from those skills. So it is like going to like a Zumba class for writing or something in the sense of like, we're not going over full manuscripts. We're going, we're honing our abilities to like do the work on a small scale. And that's the thing that happens. Like I was in uh, in my master's program, we sent in 4,000 words to have workshop. And I, I love the people in my master's program. And I think they, they're talented. I want to make that clear, but in my master's program and in every conference I went to, they had this four to 5,000 word manuscript uh, model. And I did not see people get better as quickly as they do when they look at small pieces of their writing. Because what we end up talking about in the larger manuscript model is that these bigger, well, like, let's just, you know, it should be, you know, it should be the big 
plot. They talk mm. about plot a lot, right? Mm. And they talk about these bigger things instead of being able, like, can you hold the reader's attention? Can you create tension in one paragraph? Are your sentences effective? Do they stand alone? Are you creating theme and symbolism? Are you, can we should be, and when you go pick up really good books, this is one of the tricks I tell people to do is go pick up a book you love or a book you've never read, but people recommend, open it up into the middle and then read one paragraph and see how much is being held. And you know, just from that, you, you get engaged. Every sentence matters. But when we do all these big manuscript things and not those short pieces where you're doing your calisthenics, you tend to not improve as quickly. Right. Even though I, I, you know, I have, I have people, I send my manuscripts to, I do that kind of stuff, but it's the, that regular, mm -hmm. that regular feedback on small pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's beautiful too, though, that they're not thinking just about like your writing group. They're not just thinking about the end result. They're thinking they're in the moment. They're very mindful mm -hmm. about their practice, their creative practice and enjoying it and getting better. Um, that's really beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. I love them. Um, but I also think like, I love going to generative writing groups. Like that's like, you know, one of my, like I, I used to go to, um, I used to go to writer's camp at Esalen and it was just five days of like sitting in a room with people. And then a teacher would give a craft talk and a prompt, and then we'd all write together and share it. And I'm like, I completely love that stuff. That's how I generate writing usually. Um, and I think that's amazing too. I, I mean, you know, and I'm in, I'm in like book completion group where like we send each other stuff. I've done all that stuff. And I think they all matter, but I also think one of the things that's missing is like this small piece and to do it and to do like to hone the craft just for the sake of honing the craft of like, mm -hmm. you know, not just cause you know, one more quote from Ellen <laughs> is that the, you, you either quit or you get better. That's, mm -hmm. that's the thing yes. with writing and the only people who don't get better are the people who uh, don't have any insecurities about their writing. Mm -hmm. And I've only met one person that like li literally just thought everything they wrote was perfect and didn't, and didn't take in any feedback. And I was like, uh, this person is never going to get better like ever. And they did it. I've known them, you know, they're not getting better yeah. and, but everybody else either quits or gets better. And that's the Ira Glass thing too. It's like, you just keep plodding along. You're, if you don't quit, you're going to get better. Like, and if you get feedback and you have guides and you go to, you know, you go, you get a literary community and you do all that, that stuff, you're probably going to get better a lot faster because it's not going to just be you in the dark trying right. to do stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So you need that feedback. Anyway, this all started because of detail about place will convey emotion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How do we yeah. end up here? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I think that's about it. Don't you think? Yeah. I think that that was a, <laughs> a great talk. <laughs> we covered a lot of ground. Yes. All right. Um, Desi, what are you doing? Tell us what people, how people can connect with you. Um, so you can connect with me on social media, um, Desi underscore link. I also have a um, um, blog, Outcast Mag. You can just go to outcastmag.com. And I'm working with Roxanne and Resource for Writers. We have a book club, Beyond Borders. Um, and we're going to meet the first and last Monday of every month. And you'll receive um, worksheets at, uh, throughout the month and um, emails with other for further study, like information for further study. So um, yeah, our first book is all about love. And so we're just so going to read books. Yep. We're just going to read books from all over the world and, um, and talk about them together and write together. It's going to be a great space. Mm -hmm. It's a book club. Like I, I'm encouraging people that aren't writers to go to it, but it also is specifically reading like a writer and reading from different cultures, like a writer, yes. which I think is really important. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. Like, yes. And I mean, you know about all that. I mean, when I, when I looked at your social media and I was like, she is yes. all over the place with her reading. It's amazing. Yes. yes. I love reading. I, I mean, you have to read as a writer and it's so important to read diversely as a writer because mm -hmm. 
it just shows you, you know, all the options out there, you know, you're not limited to the same structure, the same pacing, or, you know, um, different people view the world differently. And if we just read books from the US, we're not ever going to get the chance to see that and, mm -hmm. and learn about their views. It's so mm -hmm. important. Yeah. And the more that we read from diff from you know a diverse population, the more those books will get published. Yes, which I am tired of. Yes, a bunch of old white guys getting published. For sure, the pulsers and all that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um. Important. Yeah. Okay. And then what am I doing? Uh, yeah, what are you up to? A lot. A lot. <laughs> you got a lot going on. You can um. So. Yeah, I'm on re Resource for Writers. Uh, it's an online learning platform. Uh, I have every every month I have a Grateful AF workshop. It is a it's a mush up of everything I do. So it's a you know mindfulness practice, gratitude practice with a focus on how a writer um, writes better gratitude lists and gets a better in you know uh, benefits of it. And I have um, decks. And I have like personal development decks out with knock, knock. You can get them almost everywhere, but definitely at Barnes and Noble on Amazon or at knock, knock, there'll be a link in the show notes. And then you can also um, sign up for the feedback groups. They are on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. There's almost always a wait list, but getting on the wait list gets you a way better chance of getting in when there is a space. Um, and then I'm not sure when this is going to air, but I do have a basics and beyond course that's four classes and it covers a whole bunches of terminology and ideas about where to start and how to get better and all that stuff. And that starts on March 15th, 2022. And then afterwards, you can always buy the recording on resourceforwriters.com. And you can also find me on social media all over the place. <laughs> How am I? So it's spiritual underscore AF is my main. You can find that on TikTok and Instagram and on Facebook, and then also resource for writers on Instagram. And probably by this time we'll have a TikTok with, I have a TikTok but, for writers, but mm, yeah. okay. I don't know. We'll, we'll see whatever. We're thinking about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I might just put it all on spiritual AF. Yeah. So that can work too. <laughs> Anyway, that's a wrap, right? All right, guys. Happy writing. Yes. Write your butts off. Get back to us. Come join us. And remember, details, details, details. Yes. We'll probably talk about this a lot. <laughs>